Okay, this completes my formal discussion of first order systems. Now we're going to move into second order systems and talk about the time domain response of those types of systems. First a quick introduction to what we mean by a second order system. Second order systems, as the name might imply, are governed by a second order differential equation. Okay? That means that the input-output relationship for the system contains a second order derivative, but no derivatives higher than second order. Okay? This implies the same way a first order system implied one energy storage element, a second order system has two independent energy storage elements. Okay? One very interesting result of this type of arrangement is that the natural response of a second order system can oscillate with time. It won't necessarily oscillate with time under all circumstances, but it can. Therefore, if you have a natural response of a second order system, it can overshoot the final value that it gets to. First order systems always exponentially and smoothly approach their final value. Second order systems can overshoot those final values. Now, second order systems are all over the place. Okay? Now, before we get into particular circuit examples of second order systems, I want to give some specific second order system examples that you may have some intuitive feel for and discuss these concepts relative to systems that we've seen around and kind of understand on a gut level. My first second order system example will be the slinky that I use to demonstrate my different types of models in lecture one. Okay, as I mentioned in lecture one, a simple lump parameters model of this slinky consists of a mass at the end of a massless spring. So this configuration and that viewpoint of things indicates that there are two energy storage elements in this system. We have a mass which is storing a kinetic energy, okay, its velocity creates an energy E is equal to one half mv squared. The spring itself is storing a potential type energy. So the deflection of the spring creates a potential energy storage. Now if I start up this system at some initial condition, okay, if I stretch this down to an initial displacement and let it go, it will oscillate. Okay? And it will overshoot its final value. If I wait long enough, this will eventually come to rest but it'll come to rest at a point that is below the highest point that it gets to in its transient response. The system's response is overshooting its final value. Another example of a second order system is a simple pendulum. I have a mass here which is at the bottom of a string. Okay, if I displace this mass, it'll swing back and forth. If I wait long enough, it will eventually come to rest in the middle here. So my natural response to some initial condition overshoots its final value and oscillates around that final value until it finally gets to its final value. Again, I have two energy storage elements here. Essentially, this mass is storing both potential and kinetic energy. Okay, its velocity is a kinetic energy, the height that it's at provides a potential energy. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that the oscillations that you see come from an interchange of energy between the two energy storage elements. Okay? I can trade energy back and forth between the potential and the kinetic energy. When the kinetic energy is highest, when the mass's velocity is high, it's at the bottom of its arc. So high kinetic energy corresponds to low potential energy. When the mass is at the top of its arc, its velocity is zero, the kinetic energy is lowest, but the potential energy is highest. So the two energy transfer back and forth between one form and another to cause these oscillations. 
Another example of a second order system would be this bottle. If I blow across the lip of this bottle, it will produce a tone. That tone is a result of a second order system response in this bottle. If I take a look at the bottle itself, I have a neck here with a volume of gas inside the bottle. My lumped parameters model of this system will consist of a little mass of air up in the neck of this that will oscillate back and forth. This guy has some inertia. In the fluid mechanics world, this is generally called inertance. The gas inside this bottle can compress and expand. So what I've got is a little chunk of fluid that's bouncing up and down on a compressible volume of fluid. This has something that looks a lot like a spring rate. In the fluids world, it is called compliance. So what I essentially have is a little mass that's sitting on top of a spring. And as the mass bounces up and down, the pressure in this bottle responds. And as it bounces up and down, I get this oscillatory pressure here, which we hear as a tone. Okay? It's got a frequency. It oscillates. Again, we're trading energy back and forth between the kinetic energy in this inertance and the potential energy that results from compressing and expanding this compliant mass. OK, as part of our general discussion of second order systems, I want to talk a little bit more about these oscillations that you may see. And we'll examine these more carefully later in a mathematical context, but I want to introduce the topic here. As I said before, the oscillations that you see in the natural response are due to energy being traded between the two different energy storage elements that have to be present in a second order system. Any physical system is going to have some energy dissipation. Okay? My pendulum will eventually come to rest. My slinky will eventually stop bouncing. Okay? My bottle will eventually stop resonating and no longer emit a tone. Okay? So the more energy dissipation you have, the lower the amplitude of these oscillations, and the less long the oscillations will persist. The pendulum and the slinky were, both had very little energy dissipation. They oscillated for a long, long time. As the energy dissipation increases, the system is said to be more highly damped. Okay? The other side effect of energy dissipation is that if it gets high enough above some critical value, the response will no longer oscillate. Okay, so second order systems can have responses that oscillate, but if they're highly damped enough, they don't necessarily have to have an oscillating response. Okay, if you look at a car suspension system, okay, You've got some shock absorbers that are essentially a second order system. If your shock absorbers are in good shape and you go over a bump, you're not going to bounce up and down in your car. As your shock absorbers are starting to go bad, you go over a bump, it takes a while for the car to stop oscillating. The damping has reduced. When the shock absorbers go bad, the system will start to oscillate. In general, if you increase the energy dissipation, if you damp the system more highly, the system also tends to respond more slowly. Okay, and I'll discuss later more what I mean by slowly. Uh, slowly is not an exact technical term, but it's a good way to think about things. Okay? I'm done with my background information, we'll look at a couple of simple electrical circuits that have second order governing differential equations now, and then we'll do more examples over the course of the next couple of classes. The first circuit I want to look at consists of a series combination of a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor. For fairly obvious reasons, this is called a series RLC circuit. 
what I want to do is write the differential equation that governs the current through the inductor. And in fact, since these are all in series, that current is the same for all of these elements. Okay. I'm going to analyze this circuit by doing KVL around this single loop. KVL tells me that Vs of t is equal to the voltage across the resistor, V sub R of t, plus the voltage across the capacitor, V sub C of t, plus the voltage across the inductor, V sub L of t. Now each of these is related to this current, I of t, which is equivalent to I sub L of t. So V sub R of t is just equal to R times I sub L of t. Okay, voltage is resistance times current. For the inductor, V sub L of t is equal to L DIL by dt. The capacitor voltage is related by an integral equation to the current through the capacitor. So V sub C of t is equal to 1 over C integral from 0 to t of I sub L of t dt plus V sub C at t equals 0. Plugging each of these in here results in V sub S of t is equal to R times I sub L of t plus 1 over C times the integral from 0 to t of I sub L of t dt plus the initial condition V sub C at t equals 0 plus V sub L of t which is L DIL by dt. Now I want to do some manipulation of this result. I don't particularly care to have integrals and derivatives in the same equation. I want to create a second order differential equation from this rather than an integral differential equation. I'll go to the next slide and do some manipulation of this result. Okay, this was the relationship that I derived on the previous slide. I want to get rid of the integral and replace this integral differential equation with a second order differential equation. I can do this by taking the derivative with respect to time of this whole expression. Derivative of V sub S of t by dt is just dVs of t by dt. I don't know what this function is. All I know is that its derivative can be determined is equal to R is a constant DIL of t by dt plus 1 over C I sub L of t. Taking the derivative of this integral expression just results in the current. This is a constant. Derivative of this with respect to time is 0. That just leaves us with L d squared I L of t by dt squared. Here is my governing second order differential equation for this circuit. The energy dissipation is induced by the resistor R. If the value of R is small enough relative to the values of L and C, the inductor and capacitor can trade energy back and forth. And if I start this up from some initial current or initial voltage, the resulting current or voltages in the system will oscillate with time. Now let's look at another common second order electrical circuit. I now have a resistor, capacitor, and inductor in parallel with a current source. Okay? This type of circuit is called a parallel RLC circuit. I can analyze this circuit to determine the voltage across the capacitor as a result of applying some current to this system. And in fact, since these are in parallel, they all share the same voltage difference. If I do KCL at this upper node, I find that the current into the node, I sub S of t, is equal to the current through the resistor, I sub R of t, plus the current through the capacitor, I sub C of t, plus the current through the inductor, which is already labeled as I sub L of t. 
Now let's write these currents in terms of this voltage to get the differential equation governing V sub C of T. I sub R of T by Ohm's law is just V sub C of T over R. The current through a capacitor, I sub C of T is C times dV C of T by dT. And the current through an inductor is related to the voltage across the inductor through an integral expression. I sub L of T is 1 over L integral from 0 to T of V sub C of T dT plus the initial current through the inductor. Substituting those into this expression, I have I sub, sub S of T is equal to V sub C of T over R plus C dVC of T by dT plus 1 over L integral from 0 to T V sub C of T dT plus I sub L at T equals 0. Again, I've ended up with an integral differential equation. I'm going to do the same thing essentially that I did before in order to convert this to a second order differential equation. Okay. This is the integral differential equation that we obtained on the previous slide. I want to get rid of this integral. I can do that by differentiating this with respect to time. The derivative of I sub s of t with respect to time is just dis of t by dt is equal to 1 over r times the derivative of vc dt, derivative of vc of t by dt plus c times the second derivative of v sub c of t by dt plus 1 over l times v sub c of t and i sub l of 0 is just a number its derivative is 0 it doesn't show up here here is a second order derivative governing the parallel rlc circuit that concludes lecture 20. In the next lecture, I will do a lot more examples of determining governing differential equations for second order circuits. Now, in these two simple examples, I wrote a single equation in one unknown that, for both cases, resulted in an integral differential equation. I had an integral term in there. I will almost never do that. From here on out, I'm going to use a different approach in which I try to write multiple first order differential equations and then combine those to get a second order differential equation. It's a lot more general of an approach and it also leads into an important result which is state variable models which allow us to write the differential equations fairly easily governing an arbitrary order circuit. So third, fourth, fifth, twelfth, twenty-seventh order circuits.